Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Gillian Anderson, the founder of My Friend Abby, and this is our first real conversation live. The My Friend Abby organization was created in honor of my daughter, Abby, who at the age of 15 took her own life due to clinical depression. We are a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to empower young adults to actively create peer-to-peer -peer connections through grants that improve mental and emotional health. As we all know, mental health, mental wellness, and suicide prevention are critical to talk about right now, now more than ever in uh, today's climate, and it's also Mental Health Awareness Month. So as a reminder, we all have mental health. We need coping skills. We all need coping skills to navigate these strange trying times right now during this COVID-19 pandemic. Some of us are grieving for our former lives just eight weeks ago. And some of us may be grieving for friends, family, or loved ones who've passed away. On top of that, some of us are also struggling with depression, anxiety, bipolarity, and suicide ideation, just to name a few. So please know, please know that you are not alone. You are not alone and help is available. Again, it's critical for all of us to be able to maintain our mental health. Don't be afraid of that word. Mental health is what we all have and it's very, very important to talk about it and be open about it. Connection is protection and that's why we are here. That's why we have the formation of My Friend Abby. By the way, we're so very grateful to all of you who continue to follow My Friend Abby on social media and participate in all of our events and of course support My Friend Abby. Uh, I now want to introduce Sylvia Beckerman, who we have partnered with for Real Conversations. It's our new series called Real Conversations with My Friend Abby. Sylvia is a lifelong entrepreneur, writer, and podcast host. She is the founder and CEO of Life of Prey, inspiring and empowering women to embrace life events. Sylvia is also the host of the podcast series, Sylvia and Me. And she will now have a wonderful guest on our, again, very first real conversation with my friend, Abby. Welcome, Sylvia, and welcome, Dante, our special guest. Gillian, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I wanna welcome everyone here tonight. Life of Prey, we are so excited to be partnering with my friend Abby on such an important issue. Mental health, mental health awareness. And as we know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, so what better time to start our first Get Real conversation. And, with me tonight, with us tonight, we are so excited to have Dante Duval Barfield, as he calls himself, the unorthodox therapist. Now more than ever, do we need to continue the conversation? So we're gonna start the conversation tonight. And Dante, one of the first things that I want to um, ask you is we're now in a situation that we have never been in before. I don't think any of us here have ever gone through what we're going through with the unknown, with the quarantine, with the virus. Can you tell us how we can keep connected while quarantine, quarantining and what are some of the important um, items that you stress to everyone out there? What um, COVID-19 has really done it has taken all of our freedom and control and social life away. It has single-handedly in a moment, like this, this the, almost like a press of a button, your life's gone. I'm going to take it from you. How do we adapt? I don't know anybody on this planet who's been taught how to adapt that fast to like, oh, everything's gone. Now just go figure it out at home by yourself with your internet. So something I have done over the last couple months, well, since it started, is to really develop tons of things that people have connected with. So I press everybody, each one of my clients, to connect with something or somebody every single day. 
and everybody in them will say, but I want to do it this way. Then I tell them it's not going to be in person today. It's going to be online via the phone, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, these things that we can take advantage of. Um, for example, after a month, I saw people doing drive-by birthdays, parties, and parades. I never in a, I'm a I got goosebumps, goosebumps. I said, who, who took advantage of, of COVID-19? That's something I, I love saying that. Take advantage of it. Drive-by birthday parties, drive-by um, baby showers. These things are not, they would not happen in, if we weren't in COVID-19 time. No, they wouldn't. But, yeah, but there's something that changed that people are willing to still connect. And they're willing to let go of the expectation that we had before COVID-19, that we can do whatever we want. You know, the other thing that I wanted to ask you, um, and Gillian mentioned this before, the word grief. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, a lot of people think that people only grieve if you've lost someone. Mm -hmm. um, but really, I think, uh, I forget what it is, I looked it up once, the, the meaning of grief is losing, it's not only just losing a person, people are grieving, people mm -hmm. are grieving over a life that they don't longer have, and, you know, the anxiety is, is that ever coming back? Mm -hmm. So how do you, um, how do you tell someone that it's okay to grieve? Mm -hmm. That's a how to, to tell somebody to grieve. I like to maybe bring up examples of things that people have already lost and when, and they've already gone through the grieving process without even realizing it. Um, so for example, a wallet, I'll use a wallet or a purse or a remote control. <laughs> okay. Right. So if I watch somebody lose their remote control, they go through the stages of grief. <laughs> Denial. <laughs> oh no, it's not. No, I know where it's at. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't, you know, um, the anger, ugh, you know, you start throwing pillows around, um, then you get bargaining. Oh, like I should have put it where I like here. I shouldn't have, you know, and then the depression, I have to get up and turn this TV on now. I, I <laughs> and then acceptance. All right. Remote's gone. I got to figure this out. And you order a universal remote, right? Whatever it may be. <laughs> so and that happens quick. It can be a quick transaction, but that's, that's grief. <laughs> the loss of a remote control. So what I tell people to do is now acknowledge something in your life that's similar, that maybe is a little bit more soft for you to accept, to say that's the loss. That I go from wallet to dream, not say dream, but maybe like a dog, a pet, you know, I try to ease it. I try to ease people into then acknowledging COVID-19. What, what have you lost? My social life, my job, my friendship connection, my high school graduation, my, you name it, right? I could go through the periods of loss that have happened in this, and that's traumatic grief. So something that's different about this grief is it's very traumatic, very quick. Something I want everybody to do, which I hope they're cool to do, is say, all right, I have, I have grief. Let's talk about some other stuff I have. Then, and then when you think about now, all right, I have adapted before. How am I going to adapt now? Um, it's okay to know that you, you've lost something. So when you think of grief, think of something you've lost. Try to take away the weight of that loss and be okay with knowing that you've accepted some. Now, how you, we learn to do this one. Because when we do get back to normalcy, things will be different. I'm, so, I'm very clear. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that, you know, we're talking about, we're having a conversation and, you know, the whole idea behind um, the mental illness and, 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 and the suffering is the stigma and the shame. And now so many people are feeling uh, anxiety and, uh, and, and panic and fear. Mm -hmm. Should we be talking more? I mean, is this the time um, to really connect with people and actually be able to talk about how you're feeling and not feel ashamed of feeling that you know, just openly talk to your friends, your parents, mm -hmm. and have an open dialogue. Ah, uh, this is, I think, the greatest part about maybe, I'm saying greatest part, but I do look at the glass half full. Glass half full of this, that mental health is, be, is definitely become more of a hot topic that I think people are going to be, have a little bit easier of a time to accept. So something that can start this conversation personally with people is I literally almost make it a goal. Call somebody and say, I don't want to hear about what you did. I want to hear about how you feel. 
And I want to hear about like when you when you know that you've gone through a loss during COVID-19, I, I tell, hey, go talk to somebody else about it. exactly that same thing because I know they've gone through it. And it, it's it's the moment of, of realizing you're not alone. And if you have a conversation about your feelings, you're going to realize that. You're going to realize that I know juniors who can't empathize with a senior right now, right? But they can talk about the loss of their social life and that's okay. That you might, it's that sometimes people, I feel like they need to empathize exactly to talk about feelings. It's like, oh, I'm only going to talk to you about that if I've gone through it too. And I say, no, let's have some fun. Um, let's talk about it anyway, because you've gone through it in a different way. Igniting that conversation just takes a choice. I can, I can call you right now and talk about Netflix or what it was like for me to lose my job for a week and not be able to do therapy. I'm gonna, that's my choice. I'm going to give you my second. <laughs> and what does it require? Defeating that stigma. That's my mission. That's my dream. I wish everybody would do it the same way they do. Like a cough. Oh my gosh, what could that be? Everybody's cool to talk about it. I, I want to get it to the same exact point. A tear is like a cough. What's that? The flu? COVID-19? Allergies? Yo. What's that? Depression? Bad day? Anxiety? Right there. How did we get there? It's got to start with some people willing to do it. Kids. <laughs> Imagine some 16-year-olds conditioning other 16-year-olds to talk about feelings. I'm not going to have a job in 20 years. So <laughs> there's, um, there's something about the power of this conversation with our audience to, to really know that um, if I had this mind at age 16, 15, 14, really? Yeah, yeah I, don't, you know, I don't, I know I'd be in a different position in life and one that I would understand way more of my feelings I just avoided for many years. Um, well, one of the things that, you know, picking up on what you said is the fact that we all have to accept that we're feeling something. Mm -hmm. Anyone who says that they're, they're, they're okay with what's going on and they're not anxious and they're not frustrated and they're not panicked are not really accepting their feelings and, and the reality of it. Mm -hmm. And um, as Gillian mentioned um, at, the, you know, at the start of this when she talked, one of the things that um, we want to mention is you know, suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth between the age of 10 and 24. Mm -hmm. And it's been rising um, usually over the last two decades. Mm -hmm. So talking, tell me how someone who has, sees a friend and, you know, they're communicating, they're talking about their feelings, they're talking about how you know they're feeling during this pandemic mm -hmm. at what point should a friend continue talking and then tell someone great question i think if at any moment somebody feels this is the thing that's not written down this feels as though they sh should talk to somebody do it because there's my number one goal in life is to do no harm. And the emotional harm of telling somebody that there could be something going on, I can manage that. The other harm is something I don't want to have to th think about. So I'm always going to tell, talk, always. I tell this to everybody, ages zero to 150. <laughs> go, go. This is, there's, People want to feel like myself and kind of really do these things around the suicidal ideation, right? We do all this stuff, right? And I say, no, this, your opportunity might be to then say, have some resources, direct people. And I'm also a really big fan of this really, really amazing um, kind of technique called uh, QPR, where it's like CPR for suicidal ideation. It's opening your mind and being willing to also maybe give yourself some more tools to talk about these things that it's okay to talk about. I tell 12 year olds, talk to 12 year olds about it. Why? Because you're, you might be helping a 12 year old more than anybody. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say, and I'll say it this way, that every, everybody, children, everybody, we, you all need to kind of know that we have a 911, right? How come everybody goes right to 911 when it's an emergency physically? I want everybody to do the same when it comes to suicide ideation. They, I think everybody feels it when it's too much. That's when you tell. What will your friends say? Will they be mad? They'll be alive. Exactly. I don't, yeah, and I don't sugarcoat that. Very, 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 very real. <laughs> okay. 
So in, um, in everything that we've been talking about and this conversation, um, what do you think, I know that um, you mentioned it, but what is your takeaway from everything that's going on now? Um, have we started talking? I know we've started the conversation. Hopefully this will go out to a lot, a lot of people and get everyone to really start talking. But where do you see this going? Um, you know, I, I understand that the mental health call centers have been so inundated with calls. Do you think that this could be the start of people actually realizing and starting to get rid of the shame and stigma of mental illness, that it is an illness just like anything else? I want to give you uh, the reason why I, I call myself unorthodox. Um, and I'll say it's very lightly. No, it's not. And, and I'll say why I say this. This has given us a chance to have it be talked about on the news. Something I've noticed through my life and career and experience in this world is that once things go back, people forget. That's right. So here's my mission now. This is a really great flint and stone to see what we do with the spark. COVID-19, here's a spark. What you gonna do with the mental health people? That's who we are. We're second, we're, we're, we, we take the back seat. I'm, I, know, I know that. I'm not front seat, doctor, back seat, me. It's cool. I live in that field. I'm okay. How do we now, any spark I have, I'm going to take that. So instead of saying this is going to change everything, I'm going to live in my real unorthodox world and say, no, it's not, but I know it's highlighted. And as soon as I have an opportunity to bring that flame around, I'm going to go. And I hope everybody now can do that as well. Because imagine um, in 90 days, let's have the same conversation. Then another 90 days, have the same exact one as if we were in COVID-19 again. Yeah. And then another 90, we do it again. What does that take? Conditioning, time, and practice. When the world gets flipped upside down in, in a traumatic event, I'm not too sure if that's going to be the thing that makes all of this change. But I know, I'll say this, with the <laughs> meeting you all in the last four or five days reminds me of how it will. Because um, it's Tuesday, and we talk about this, I don't know, six to eight, I don't know, quick, fast. That's motivation. That's taking advantage. That's COVID-19. That's taking a flame. Um, so thank you for showing me how this could be changing this forever. Um, I will be just keep lighting it around to everyone. Well, I'm glad you are. Um, Dante, um, you have laid it out on the table and I think what you just said is so important that this is a spark and we need to keep it going. Um, we are now going to, if, if I know that um, we had said before, if you have any questions, this is the time to um, put them out there. And um, let me see, I do have to put these on in order to take a look. Um, okay, here's, here's a, uh, a question. Um, I live with bipolar disorder that is mild, but significant enough to have me cycle through depression and, and hypomania. It's a biologic, biological disorder. My brain is simply wired differently. I'm fortunate to have many tools to help me and understanding spouse, a wonderful therapist and medication. It is disappointing to me that most pe people I speak to educated, well-meaning people who simply don't believe this exists. They only believe in situational depression. The stigma around non-situational mental health disorders is tremendous. What is your recommendation for reaching people who don't get it or should know better? Um, I would say this very, very happily and proudly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take bipolar um, as if it were me being Black. And not at once am I going to walk around and feel and apologize for how my identity operates. So now let's look at this like bipolar. Oh, I'm manic, I'm very depressed today. That's who I am, that's, that's what this is. Mm -hmm. Do I need to keep apologizing for it? I tell everybody, all, even people who come to me who are diagnosed bipolar one, two, when they learn how to move around with that and not defend it anymore, to know that it's valid and the world's not gonna validate you. <laughs> freeing yourself from that and holding on to your 
stuff. And I say stuff, I'm going to say bipolar, but holding on, that's yours. Appreciate it and love it. Because I love all my diagnoses that I've been given, the ones maybe genetically, maybe, maybe through experience, but the ones that have been invalidated in society, those are the ones that I help people understand with an identity. Because it's not going to go away. If you can learn to accept it and tell the world, screw you, <laughs> like my I like my bipolar. If you own it, if you own it, no one can take it uh -huh. away from you. And if they say it's not real, I say, okay, bye. And I just keep going, you know, because tomorrow I, I have to take my real drug for my fake thing. Okay, whatever. you know, it's, that's where I live. I'm just going to continue to live my life. And I tell everybody with that, because I'm not going to get rid of your bipolar. It doesn't happen. But I'm going to help you maybe learn some different ways to acknowledge it. Well, that, that's great. I love that answer. All right. Um, what are some resources that people with anxiety and depression can utilize from home? How can someone with anxiety and depression cope with living with family members who dismiss their symptoms? Great mm -hmm. question. That's very good. How can you cope with anxiety and depression? We are, America's built to cope. And most of the things we do are coping. Um, I, it's like hobbies, happy hour, <laughs> um, tons of things. We are, the world is full of them. So when, I, so when people ask me, how do I cope? I say, let's not go type, how do I cope in the computer? I wanna ask everybody, what do you wanna do? What do you like to do? What are some things you think you're not gonna be good at? What are some things you think are gonna be interesting? Put them all on the table and go fail at every single one of them. And then come back and tell me what it was, how anxious you were during all of that distracting. And all of a sudden, now I'm gonna ask you, which one did you like the best? And then we're gonna keep going. Then like a couple months is gonna pass. And then you're not going to be talking to me about the anxiety as much because you're now operating and managing it in a different way. So everybody out there who's got depression, anxiety, I want you all to first anxiety, live, no, learn to live with it. It's not going anywhere. I teach people how to manage your anxiety and depression. I can't get rid of it. I can teach you how to manage it. Some of my clients name it. It's, and they think it's, it's a little weird, but I'm like, yeah. And then the funniest one is um, Monica from Friends. Hilarious. That's your anxiety. So part of it is like, all right, now it's with me. What do I do with this? Ah, I go build a birdhouse. It's, it's these, <laughs> it's like, what are you going to put that energy? I'm nervous. I know you're nervous. I don't know what's going to happen either, but what do you want to do? I don't know. There's some blue jays outside. I like birds. I'm going to go build it. Okay. There's something to manage it. Um, now living with somebody who's going to invalidate your mental health. That's, that's why I'm, that's why I have this job because everybody <laughs> validates mental health. Could you imagine if families didn't do that? If everybody validated your mental health experience, I literally wouldn't have work. This is, the, I, this is what gives us mental health and illness, the invalidation of our sadness. It's like telling somebody who has COVID-19 that your cough is a laugh. No, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a cough, it's a laugh every time. And then you feel sick and you have no taste and, you, and they don't believe you. That's... <laughs> Okay, let's see. Uh, next question. Do you have experience with genetic testing to help better prescribe medication? What are your thoughts? Oh, genetic, no, I won't even go into that one. Um, but I will say this, that I'm a big fan, a big, big fan of the brain. So my trauma work is all related to the brain. So something that I do like to at least have people explore if they're into like the genetic idea of life and how this can really help you, I would also have that person be open-minded to how the brain can help you heal. So I introduce people to other concepts kind of similar to that where I dive into um, how the brain operates. So I tell somebody to be, keep, keep opening your mind. There are other things out there kind of similar that might not be medication-based. I can help you understand uh, genetics and your therapy. Okay. Um, I've, been, I've seen toxic positivity being thrown around in response to people who are talking about how they are taking advantage of quarantine, mm -hmm. finding gratitude, learning new skills, et cetera. What are your thoughts around this phrase, toxic positivity, positivity, especially in this context. I feel like people are doing exactly what you said is a great idea to do right now. Yeah. Oh, toxic positivity. It's a great way to spend enjoying your life and having a good time. Um, the, the reason why I think that word toxic positivity got thrown out is because there has been a, mo a movement of motivation, I think, through COVID-19, where people put this expectation of like, 
writing in like a New York Times bestseller in 45 days while you're trapped in your house. That, that when you tell somebody or promote somebody or motivate somebody to do something good to help manage your anxiety and depression and it turns into a podcast or a book, is that toxic positivity or taking over COVID-19? I kind of want people to accept their goodness in life and be okay with people talking about it in a negative context. That if you do something good, you don't have to blast it to the world and tell them to do it as well. That positivity isn't meeting people where they're at because there are people out there whose positivities are showering today. So rather than pushing your success and happiness on people, I tell people just to hold it and then look at other people's as well and acknowledge that the same exact way. Uh, I know a lot of people that have been stuck with that. I, as a therapist, promote people to manage their anxiety, and it's turned into some of the greatest things that people made fun of them for. I can't believe he did something. He should have just stayed at home and did nothing. Oh, Like people who feel bad for making projects, picking up a new hobby. I know people who literally stopped doing something because they said, no, you shouldn't do that. You should just stay home. <laughs> okay. Um, I know somebody who stopped running because they were trying to get faster to run a marathon after this. Somebody said, why are you No, don't do that. Oh, okay. And then you come to somebody like me and I'm always going to lean on the other side and I'm never going to call it toxic positivity. Um, but I will acknowledge how that weight of being positive can play a role in somebody who's not feeling good. And that comparison and normalizing. Um, there are people out there who do good things. You love to shove it down people's faces, social networking. They love to show the greatness and nobody knows what that's really like for people who just don't have it in them. Um, and I like to sit with the people who do don't and find some space to do something small that is okay. That still is positive. I have one, here's one question for you. I am shutting down more and more and becoming very isolated. People don't want to hear about depression and anxiety. What specific language would you suggest a friend may use in response to a friend who confines about struggling with their mental wellness and suicidal thoughts? You asked me a question a little, like a little bit ago about when to reach out for help. And I'm just gonna leave that one there. That my next, I have an episode I'm uh, recording now called Just a Friend. And learning the boundary of friendship is very, very valid, I think. And I think a lot of people should really understand what that means. Because sometimes friends don't have the ability to really hold on and manage all of that. That I, I even myself, you know, I'm mindful of just, understanding that that can sometimes play a role in people's lives. And that is at the moment that I have resources to provide. I have conversations about, is there somebody else or is there some other support we can find? I literally have developed and built a nonprofit to provide 24 seven care for people who were like, who had this, to find space to acknowledge that they need to check in. They don't have insurance. They don't really have ways of making this big therapeutic thing, but I need to check in. So I got it, I got you. Developing things like that, so people who are stuck in those moments can maybe find another person who they can connect with that they want to like with their friend to relieve some of that. Um, it's really hard to have a friend to, to, to tell everything to. Uh, it's, it's a complicated one. Exactly why I'm going to be talking about it more and more. Because I think during this time that's been highlighted. Friends have been really playing pseudo therapist. And I train myself for thousands of hours to hold on to some of this stuff, you know, and that that takes time, training, and practice. I couldn't, I couldn't answer that in two minutes to teach somebody how to do that. I would tell you to go to school and come, come be my intern. <laughs> they're learning hard. And they're going home like, Dante, what do I do? And I'm like, this is hard. This takes time. Um, oh, yes, that's, I, think, I hope that works as an answer. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, next question. Dante, first off, go Sixers. I guess you're wearing... Yeah, yeah, I'm filled up. Yes, yes. <laughs> I didn't realize it. Yeah. Uh, second, I'm starting my master's in mental health counseling in the fall. What is one piece of advice that you wish you had with you before you started this pursuit? I wish I had my email in 2020 to talk to myself. So take my email and talk to me after this. I'm going to give you far better of an answer um, than you would ever get from me in this little video. But I will say at least a quick one. One thing I wish I had, I wish I remembered that I was Black. And I wish I remembered that I understood that this field that I was getting into was going to be far more than just helping people. I don't wear a therapist cape. 
I wear a jersey and sometimes a, a suit jacket, <laughs> high top bands, and um, I have a high top pro. And <laughs> I've learned to be me. So I will say this, don't you lose yourself. When you go into that school and you start learning all this therapy tools, don't you lose yourself. Because when you get out, you're going to be for you. And you will be judged for you and people like you. When people leave my office, they don't say Dante had really good therapy tools. They say Dante. I, I, I think they say that my, my relationship with Dante was something. Um, I don't think it was the mindfulness, the trauma, all that stuff. Uh, no, it's the relationship is all really all that matters. <laughs> Hey, okay, here's one. How do you manage your own anxiety? For me? Is that like a personal one more or so? Yeah, that's it. Uh, somebody asked and I wanted to know how you manage your own oh, anxiety. Man. So if you want to know me, you know, I will say this. I grew up an only child, so I tell people I'm built to manage my own anxiety. <laughs> that everything I do is like solo me. I have so many things that I do that I just can always engage in. And I've learned, and this took time though. This wasn't like snap of the fingers. I've learned not that Anything I want to do in this world, I'm going to commit to. I have zero fear of failure. Um, and I'll say this very, very lightly because it can, might come off the wrong way, but I don't really have too much to lose. After losing my mother at age six and acknowledging the grief of her loss and living with that and accepting it and being in this space I never thought I'd be in, um, I wake up every day with a mission to do more. Uh, I want to learn how to sail. I'm going to maybe even learn how to fly a plane and I don't even really like flying that much but something inside of me says why not if there's never an opportunity to go and be anxious I love it anxiety drives me uh how scared can I be to go make life better stop me there's really nothing there you know I write a book cool um start a podcast great um Tuesday night seven o'clock hang out and talk to uh people about mental health yeah so it's all keep going. How do I manage it? What's in, I live with my anxiety so much I turn into excitement. My anxiety's name is uh, rage. That's my rape. Go. Rage. It's not anxiety to me. I don't, <laughs> it's odd, but that's, you know, I, I've taken it out of my vocabulary. Okay. Um, we have time for one more. Um, and uh, if you can, if you like. what, what yeah. we're going to ask is what is the name of your nonprofit? Oh, get lit. Um, live your truth. So I partnered up uh, with a person in Philadelphia and we have our group practice. Uh, we have eight to 10 therapists hired and we started the nonprofit last year and it just got approved by the IRS to be official. So what we are doing with the nonprofit is free therapy. I, I have, wow. one of my missions in life is to, um, to defeat this stigma. I have to make it available, access and affordable. I, I know therapy is like an accessory because it costs money. If you have insurance and if you even use this, the care from the state to get the stuff that is helpful and free, it might not be that good of care. And I have no shame saying that. You might just get thrown to some, some therapist and just is in the work doing it, burnt out, not even engaged. I've created something different um, to provide free therapy to people, people who can't afford it from marginalized inner city neighborhoods LGBTQ, people of color, you name it, who come in, who want to who better themselves. And they wanted to do it for years, but they didn't have $20 a week. Um, I'm hoping to provide therapy to thousands for $0, because my service is just a better you. Um, and if I can do that for free forever, I'm going to keep doing that. So that's what the nonprofit is. Uh, I am getting a little emotional talking about it, but... <sighs> Okay. <laughs> I was mistaken before because we have one last question, which oh, I think is, okay. is important. Um, what if you have isolated before this and don't have anyone to turn to? What if you have? I'm sorry. Like, In other words, what if you've been isolated before COVID and now you're isolated and you don't have anyone to turn to? What should, what advice could you give someone? Uh, this is, um, I'll say, Two of my favorite words, chosen family. When I hear those words that I, I was isolated before and I'm isolated now, I'm not going to say this is true, but I'm going to spin a narrative in my head that you might have been lonely. You might not have people in your life. You might be missing something that other people have that just come normal. Family, friends, relationships, co school, colleagues, you name it. You might not have those deep connections as well. So one thing I'll say is be open to this thing of chosen family that there are people out there that you can create relationships with 
that are that give you safety, peace, and this thing called connection that might not come in a way you ever ever expected. I grew up without a mom, dad, at a grandma. I have some amazing mother figures, father figures, aunt figures, cousin figures. And where they all come from? No, no, it's not even black. <laughs> and how? I wanted to connect and I didn't have it. So I always use my one narrative to remind people that I get loneliness very deeply. And the only way out is to connect. And it's very hard to know that to do that comes the work that I've committed my life to help people start doing because it's not that easy. Well, Dante, you certainly have helped us. I am so glad that you were able to do this. We started off with real conversations. Thank you so much. Gillian, I want to turn it back to you. Uh, this has been wonderful. And, you know, as we said, this is a series and we want to continue this because we need the conversation. We need to talk about this. Gillian, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, very emotional. This has been an amazing uh, way to spend an evening. I, um, I want to repeat that um, connection is protection. Uh, that's why we started My Friend Abby as well. We really want to make sure at a very young age, you know, it's important to start talking about all of these things around the age, I think, of 10. Mental health, mental wellness. Don't be afraid of the word mental. Um, mental illness runs in a lot of families. Um, all of this is so important to talk about. And as Dante was saying, just, you know, be yourself, be, be real. And um, I, I want to um, really, really thank Sylvia and Dante for doing this. I feel like we need to do this again, if everybody's watching. <laughs> I think we could go on for hours. Um, I, I want to mention the uh, fact that there is a lot of support out there. There's group support. There's, it, there seems to be some new stuff that's popping up because of what we're going through right now. But let me remind you of the crisis text line. Uh, it's not just for uh, suicide ideation, but it's for any kind of crisis. But the crisis text line, uh, you text HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741741. And there's an expert on the other end. So. And you know, if you really, uh, as Dante said, you know when you need help and you know when you need to reach out to someone. There's also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 800-273-8255. Again, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You can Google all of these things. Uh, look for all of the um, uh, things that are available to you. But again, reach out to somebody every day. And Dante, we cannot thank you enough. This has just been really moving and so, so important to talk about. If anybody has any questions, you can certainly email me at gillian at myfriendabby.org. And um, I also want to thank Alex Katz, who is our uh, kind of wizard behind the scenes for all of this this evening. And she's actually the one that says it more than anybody, connection is protection. So um, keep all of this in mind. I'd love to hear your feedback on this. And um, thank you all again so, so very much for, for joining us. Thank you.